so we are entering the last leg of our introduction part and i don't know whether you can read the names on the slides these are the people we have met so far uh, starting with nicholas copernicus or even before that raymond lull and a host of people including galileo and hobbes and descartes pascal pascal who said that perception is in our minds and if we smell the smell of a rose then that is a reaction to the particles that are impinging upon our no nose and we are sort of perceiving based on that essentially so we saw that there was a strand of reasoning now this is you can say the prehistory of ai and you can see from this diagram that it's about more than 500 years of history and there are two strands to this and one is that the physical side of trying to make talking heads walking statues and statues which can you know nod their heads and that kind of stuff the engineering or the physical or the contraption side of it because there was this belief that it can move autonomously it must be able to think also is actually so there's a leap of faith that one used to make the other strand was the emergence of the notion of the mind at some point you know creatures like us would simply live in a world and see the world and believe that what we see is what the world is like but then along came somebody like copernicus and he said that you think that the sun is going round the earth during the day but that's not what's happening what's happening is that the earth is rotating and it creates an illusion of the sun going round the earth so the fact that what you see is not necessarily what is out there had already started coming out and gradually then the distinction between what we see and what we think started happening and at some point descartes said there are two worlds out there one is the world of our mind and the other is the world of the body and he had this idea of mind body dualism then as we moved along uh, we saw kant for example immanuel kant one of the most influential philosophers uh, from europe who said that we perceive the world in terms of a priori knowledge that we have in our heads and we mold the world that we see in into those a priori knowledge structures that we have of course he did not use the term knowledge structures which we use nowadays or concepts that we have essentially and at the same time the mechanical contraptions are becoming more and more sophisticated uh, there was this duck uh in france by vaconson so if some of you saw bbc every sunday if you see bbc you get something for this course so this last sunday bbc showed uh, a news item in which in the south of france they have opened a museum of all these talking walking mechanical creatures essentially which apparently were very popular and they used to keep them in shop windows to attract shoppers and things like that and i could see there this vaconson's duck also amongst the displays so they were getting sophisticated and we see that uh, from so these two strands are merging merging together you know this moving creatures and thinking creatures in some sense uh, so pascal for example we will uh, sort of get recognize him here for the fact that he was the first person to invent a calculating machine of course it could only do addition but nevertheless it was a calculating machine which was sort of improved later by leibniz into something which could do more than addition it could do multiplication and so on and it became more and more sophisticated till we came to charles babbage who invented a, a machine which could store a program and run the instructions in that program which is the notion of computers that we are still working with essentially we also met alan turing who sort of tried to put down this debate on what is intelligence can machine things and that kind of stuff he he proposed the turing test that we saw earlier he did many other things uh, and we'll just have a brief mention on of him later essentially okay. so let me remind you of this definition by hogeland ai is a quest for building machines with minds of their own and we had asked this question towards the end of the last lecture so what is what are minds we will come to that question later Uh, today but a little bit later 
before that we let's complete the history so we have seen the pre digital computer eras so far the mechanical contraptions that people used to build how did ai progress after the digital computer came into being which is just around the time when alan turing uh, was around so let's first begin with this piece of information which tells us how did we get this name artificial intelligence essentially okay and the name was devised by john mccarthy uh, i think we all know john mccarthy in for some form of another amongst other things he invented the language lisp uh, which became very popular in ai uh, for many years so the name is credited to john mccarthy and marvin minsky along with Lord Shannon, who organized this conference called the Dartmouth Conference uh, in Dartmouth College uh, in 1956, where McCarthy is credited with having devised this name, artificial intelligence. Now, many people have said that no, this name is not a nice name. You should use something like heuristic programming or machine intelligence or something else. But somehow the name has stuck since that time, and we all know this area as artificial intelligence. so hogeland for example suggests that you could call it synthetic in intelligence so artificial is and he makes this comparison with pearls for example you know you have real pearls you have artificial pearls which are kind of fake essentially but you also have synthetic pearls which are not fake but which are pearls but which have been sort of made by humans so the conference was organized and its charter was that it would do a two month 10 man study of artificial intelligence a name was coined there on the basis of the conjecture that every aspect of learning or any other feature of intelligence can in principle be so precisely described that a machine can be made to simulate it okay so the focus of the emphasis is that when we are talking about intelligent behavior it is something which can we can describe up to the minutest detail and if we can do that we can make a machine do it essentially so that was the idea behind that so who are the people uh, who organized this we'll see them in a moment so for those of you who are interested in history so we sh you should look at these two books which i mentioned earlier this one book called machines who think that is shown here by pamela mccorduck the chapter 5 describes the full chapter on the dartmouth conference and the other book is john hogeland which is ai the very idea which is the more philosophical side of things essentially we'll come back to that a bit later Okay, so who were the organizers of this conference? We have already said that they were John McCarthy. He was then an assistant professor at Dartmouth, and uh, he has done many, many. So, so these people have contributed so much to AI uh, in one way or the other that it's you know not easy to list there what all they did. They were very active people. So McCarthy invented Lisp. Uh, he invented something called situational calculus which we will may or may not see in this course uh, he is also credited with having invented the alphabet algorithm which we will see a bit later <coughs> in this course and he did lot of work on logic and common sense re reasoning essentially which we'll see if we can come to that later marvin minsky the only person of these who still alive was uh, in a junior fellow at harvard and he and mccarthy towards set up the mit lab uh, ai lab in mit and as we will see in the history part today all, most of this work in ai was concentrated in a few places in the us and a few places in europe and it's not as if everybody everywhere was working on ai so mit lab was one cmu was another place stanford was another place and you know a couple of places in europe essentially so minsky is very well known for his idea of frames which is a way of structuring knowledge into interconnected components and it's basically the forerunner of what we call as object oriented programming nowadays essentially he also wrote a very influential book called society of the mind and more recently a book called the emotion machine essentially hmm? because somebody had once pointed out during our initial lectures that machines cannot display emotions so maybe you should look at that book another person there was rochester who was 
the inventor or the, the designer of this IBM 701 machine, which was the best machine around at that time. He wrote the first assembler for that machine. He supervised Arthur Samuel into writing a program for playing the game of checkers, which we will talk about a little bit, uh, which was one of the early successes of AI essentially. Now, it turns out that this Samuel's program was a learning program and Samuel's goals were actually learning. He wanted to see how computers could learn and his program was a program which became better and better as it played more and more essentially. And this kind of a generated a kind of a fear amongst the people that these machines will become smarter than us, more powerful than us and things like that. We will come back to that point, point a little bit later when we talk about this checkers program. And finally, Claude Shannon, everybody knows Claude Shannon because of his in information theory. In fact, he was a person who had hired Minsky and McCarthy as interns when they were graduate students and it is there that they got this idea of putting together this conference which will talk about this new field which was coming up called artificial intelligence. But there were a couple of guys who were in some sense a show stealers at that conference essentially. So, let us first see who they were. Uh, the names we have <coughs> might have mentioned before Herbert Simon and Alan Newell. And Pamela McCordick says that they that about them that two vaguely known persons working at Car Carnegie Tech. At that time, CMU was not the Carnegie Mellon University, it later on became CMU, but at that point it was Carnegie Tech and Rand, who were also invited to the Dartmouth conference, and as she writes, almost as an afterthought. And it is these two people who really created a big impact at the conference because they had, along with J. C. Shaw, who also worked at Rand, built this, written this program called the Logic Theorist. It was a logical reasoning machine, it, a theorem proving machine. It could prove theorems in mathematics, uh, LT as short it was. So, they say about this, it was the first program deliberately engineered to mimic the problem solving skills of a human being essentially. Hmm? So, Simon and Newell were greatly influenced by the way human beings solve problems because after all, we are sort of existential examples of smart creatures, you know, we sort of are thinking creatures, if you do not want to call us machines, uh, who operate very effectively in the world, you know, solving problems and getting along and so on. And he wrote a book, uh, they wrote a book called Human Problem Solving, which became very influential later essentially. Now, this program logic theorist went on to prove several theorems from Russell and Whitehead. See, Russell and Whitehead had embarked upon this grand exercise of formalizing all knowledge and they said you know everything that you can do in mathematics we will put it down on a piece of paper. Their great dream was shattered in 1931 by Kurt Godel when he came and proved that you cannot become powerful, you cannot construct powerful enough systems, reasoning systems which are consistent at the same time. So, either you can be very powerful in the sense very expressive that you can talk about all kinds of things or you can be consistent, but not both at the same time and he showed that uh, this uh, is something which will always follow if you try to build powerful enough systems. And as some of you might know, his arguments are basically centered around self reference and, and self negating sentences. So, sentences like I am lying. Uh, or the story about this barber, which uh, Russell, and Russell was so worried about, that if there is a village in which the rule is that everyone who does not shave himself is shaved by the barber, then the question is who shaves the barber essentially. Because the barber, if he shaves himself, then he is shaving himself and therefore he cannot shave himself. And so, this kind of conundrums came, come through self referential uh, sentences, and Kurt Godel showed that any formal system which is expressive enough will end up becoming inconsistent. Which means in our the kind of things that we want to study in that higher order logics are never going to be consistent and complete at the same time. We will come to these notions at some later point of time. But 
the simpler logic says first order logic or predicate logic is good enough for us and first order logic can be seen to capture everything that we are doing in programming essentially. So, our programs can whatever we can express in programs we can do consistently in some sense. Now, this uh, program LT produced some shorter and more elegant proofs that were present in this Principia Mathematica. This is a book by Russell and Whitehead and apparently, so the story goes I do not know whether it is true or not, but apparently the journal of symbolic logic or journal of logic or something refused to accept a paper because it was authored by a computer program, co-authored by a computer program. I do not know whether this story is true or not, but you can find it in some places essentially. So, let us first talk a little bit about Simon and Newell. Uh, Simon was a multifaceted person as you can see from this quote from Wikipedia. He was a political scientist, economist, sociologist, psychologist and a professor mostly at CMU whose research range across all these fields cognitive psychology, cognitive science, computer science, public administration, economics and so on and so forth. He went on to get a Nobel prize in economics and his long time associate was Alan Newell uh, about 10 years his junior uh, and they did a lot of collaborative work together essentially. So, Alan Newell created this language called IPL in which LT was implemented some a little bit more on them because they give us something which we base our work on. So, they became leading figures at CMU uh, and they wrote uh, this program called general problem solver which was based on human problem solving and how human beings use heuristics to solve problem and we will visit this general problem sol solver idea this idea of mean sense analysis which is a heuristic that we use we will see that sometime later in the course essentially. Their work also brought to focus the information processing approach to AI, which means that you are talking about that if you want to create intelligent systems, it is enough to do information processing as opposed to this other strand of effort, which was to say that we will build systems from bottom up, we will we'll put together the components which make intelligent systems and so on and eventually they will become intelligent. He said not you do not have to do all that you can work at the information level or as some people call as the knowledge level and build intelligent systems essentially. And one of the things which came out of CMU, one of the many things which came out of CMU uh, was this cognitive architecture called SOAR which you can even now download and use to build uh, good applications. So, one of the things they talked about was this architecture for AI what do you need for AI. So, we have this idea of the physical symbol systems and a symbol is something as far as we are concerned uh, a perceptible something which stands for something else. So, a symbol stands for something else. If you write the numeral 7, it stands for the number 7. Hmm? Of course, it is not the number 7, it just stands for the number 7 and we could have in a different script, we could have written it differently. A symbol system is a collection of symbols. So, for example, a data structure or a English language word or even a musical tune essentially. So, you put them together you have a symbol system. So, you have an alphabet which is made of symbols and then you put together things of from that alphabet and you have a symbol system and a physical symbol system is something which obeys laws which are like the laws of physics essentially. Okay. So, in some sense if they if, if you can manipulate them using well defined laws uh, or rules then they are physical in that sense they are physical. Okay in the sense that they can be manipulated according to these laws. So, anything you can use algorithms or the procedure for long division for example and so on and so forth. The important statement that they made is known as the physical symbol system hypothesis. It says that a physical symbol system has a necessary and sufficient means to generate intelligent action. So, what they are saying that all you need in, in our terminology all you need to build intelligent systems is the ability to create data structures and write algorithms which will operate upon those data structures. You need nothing else essentially. That is the basic infrastructure you need. So, unlike for example, Roger Penrose who feels that the human mind or human brain has some kind of physics which is going on which we cannot replicate. They said nothing of the sort. If you can do information processing which means if you can operate on symbol systems using well defined algorithms, you can create intelligent behavior. So, this is uh, known as the symbolic AI or classical AI. Classical AI 
follows this principle uh, that it is a top down design approach to building intelligent systems that you will create your data structures and you will write your algorithms and you will produce your intelligent systems or as Hoggelin calls it good old fashioned AIS.